So we're going to continue with our retreat theme of We Are at War. We've talked about the world and the flesh as two enemies of the Christian. This is traditional Christian teaching, Catholic teaching, that goes back to the letter to the Ephesians where Paul talks about the world, the flesh, and the devil in chapter 2, the beginning of chapter 2. And um, it's something that unfortunately is neglected quite a bit nowadays. We rarely hear teaching about this, and it's so essential to be able to know who our enemies are. We are in a war, and we need to understand the battlefronts that we face and uh, the reality of this warfare. So I want to talk about the devil, the third and a really primary part of the warfare that we face to understand how the Lord wants us to approach these areas. All three of the battlefronts are areas where Jesus wants us to understand his disciples how to confront these because we are the children of God. We are the Father's children, and we've been empowered through baptism and by the grace that's given to us, the the power of the Holy Spirit, to be able to have authority to be changed by his grace at work within us. So it's not just up to us. We have the power of God working in us to be able to overcome in each of these areas, the world, the flesh, and the devil. So I say that by way of beginning. One of the things you note is in the Bible, from the first book, Genesis, the book of beginnings, all the way to the last book, Revelations, you find out we are involved, humanity is involved in a cosmic war. And most fundamentally, this warfare is for the lives of men, women, and children. And it's there completely through the scriptures that you see this this reality that exists. And as regards the devil, the church has always taught that he is real, that he is a powerful being, with intelligence that is ancient from before the creation uh, of the world and that he is bent on the destruction of humanity and has a great hatred for the church. And not only does the church teach that, but obviously it's founded on Jesus' life, the witness of his life, his teaching, and his authority over the devil. So... The reality that we face is that this is sobering news. It's not happy news, but we have to understand this truth in order to be fruitful, to be successful in living our lives as children of God, living as disciples of Jesus. We need to understand these areas of assault. The second thing I want to mention to you about this is that the secular world including many Christians in secular cultures, as a matter of fact, are very vulnerable to satanic deception and influence precisely because they don't believe in the devil. They just don't believe in him. And if they do, they think, oh, it's some mythological character or it's you know, something we do at Halloween where we prance around in little red tights with a pitchfork and a goofy face on us. And so it puts the folks in many secular cultures in in a place of high risk in terms of his deception and influence. I just uh, recently was reading about this uh, tragic situation. This young adult couple, man and woman, decided they would bicycle around the world. They maintained a blog. And in the blog, the guy goes on to explain how there is no such thing as evil. And he went on to explain, really, if we just come to know one another, we'll see and understand our differences. Well, that couple ended up being violently murdered by Islamic terrorists who said death to all unbelievers. And we've seen numbers of situations like that. For a moment, the veneer of everything's okay gets torn off, and you realize there's more going on than what meets the eye. So we want to be aware of the reality of the enemy and um, how to deal with him. So 
First of all, let me talk about how Jesus uh, talks about him and what he wants to educate us uh, about, about him. He, he calls him devil and, the sat- and Satan. Satan is the accuser. That's a great way of talking about him. He's a fallen angel who was created good by God. Note that he's a creature. He's not God. He's not the dark side of the force. But he's a creature who rebelled against God, wanted to be as God, and in his pride was thrown down with other angels because of the rebellion against the Lord. And again, he's powerful, he's intelligence, and he's experienced at war with humanity and with war against the church. Jesus told us he's a liar. And that's just critical to understand he's a liar. The Lord said, when he lies, he speaks according to his nature, for he is a liar and the father of all lies. Another reason why we don't want to be given to the sin of lying ourselves. It just puts us under the wrong spirit. So he's a liar. He is a murderer. From the beginning, Jesus says, he was a murderer and he has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. Again, when we see these terrorist attacks or we see these acts of violence by individuals, evils unmasked. Paul tells us in Ephesians that our warfare is not against flesh and blood, but it's against these principalities, these rulers, these evil spirits under the control, under the dominion of the devil. And so our enemies aren't these individuals. Many times people end up being under his influence and used by him to to fulfill his wishes, his will. So he's also a thief. The thief comes, Jesus tells us, only to steal, kill, and destroy. And this is an area where you can see it in all kinds of ways. It's not just about things like possessions, but it's also him stealing people's lives. Some people who are in Christ, they're baptized as Catholics or other Christians, and then they're, they're gone. I pray for some of my kids. I pray from a scripture in the Old Testament, Lord, take back what's been stolen. He's a thief, and he intends to steal as much as he can. And we want to pray in resistance against that. He's the accuser of the brethren. In the Revelations, it talks about how he accuses the brethren day and night, 24-7. And this is important also to think about practically, personally. He accuses us. That's one of the key ways that he, he comes at us. He condemns us. He comes disguised as an angel of light. And this is a common tactic of, of the enemy, and that is he will take something that God has created good and he'll twist it, he'll pervert it, so that it's used in a way that really is wicked, that's immoral. So take sex. Sex was created by God. Good news both in terms of our gender being created in God's image. He made us male and female. But in terms of marriage between a man and a woman, sex is good not only for procreation, but for the pleasure, the blessing of the two of them in their unity. But the enemy takes sex and removes it from the rightful place of marriage and scatters it out in all kinds of different places that bring only destruction to individuals. And the key kind of area that's, that where he's really got a grip is in pornography for both men and women and for kids. He's taken something that God created, perverts it, twists it. So he comes disguised as an angel of light, offering something that promises that this is going to be pleasurable, it's going to be good. And outside of the context of marriage, it always causes pain and destruction. Also, the devil comes to neutralize us. He will use these different areas that we've talked about in the retreat, the world and the flesh, in areas where you noted, I know this is an area I need to pay attention to, I need to bring to the Lord. He will use those to neutralize you, to move you towards lukewarmness. 
So in Revelations 3, the Lord talks to his church and says, Would that you were hot or cold, but because you are lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Well, why is that? Why is that such a stern warning from the Lord Jesus? Well, here, here, here's the reason. Lukewarm Christians are an anti-witness to Christ and his church. We want to be a passionate, pure, and devoted to Jesus. And look, we're all sinners. We're on, on, under construction, so to speak. So it's okay to acknowledge my sinfulness, my weakness, my failings. But I want to live for Jesus, don't you? I want to live for him. I want to honor him. I want to bring glory to the Father. So we want to go for it. And the enemy's intention is if he can't destroy us, if he can't get us to deny Christ, he'll bring us into a place of lukewarmness. Finally, on this point about what Jesus says about the devil, folks, he's defeated. He's a defeated enemy. And it's very important for us to understand he was defeated by the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ and by his rising, again, bringing all of us to a place where we're reconciled to the Father and have this eternal life that begins here and now in relationship with him. Something that is very easy uh, question to raise is, well, wait a minute, if that was what happened, the Lord's defeated the enemy, why all this terrible stuff still? So think about it this way, if you will. In World War II, the decisive battle was what's called D-Day, the invasion of the Allies at Normandy against Nazi Germany. It was the decisive battle. But it took another full year before V-Day, where the victory was decisive. It was finished. It was complete. And so you and I live in what the scriptures talk about as the end times or the last days The last days are the time between Christ's life on the earth, his death and rising, his ascension into heaven, and his coming again in glory. And what you and I are entrusted with is not cowering in a basement afraid of these enemies, but we're called to occupy. The church in the past was much more frequently called the the church militant. Because not only were we to occupy, stand our ground, we're to advance the kingdom of the Lord. And you and I have been anointed with the Holy Spirit, given to us in baptism, and for many of us released and renewed as adults when we ask Jesus to be Lord of our life and ask to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. We're commissioned to go for the salvation of others, to help others know there's a God in heaven who loves them. And there's a way to enter into friendship with God through what Jesus has done and in the power of the Holy Spirit. So we're to to advance the kingdom. We're to advance in this warfare by being righteous and being saints, by being disciples of the Lord. And he's given us full authority over the enemy. That's what Jesus says. I've given you authority over all the power of the enemy. So let me talk about some practicals of living in the truth. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And when he says that, he is the embodiment. He is the way. He is the truth. He is life itself. And we want to stay close to the Lord. Hang with the Lord. Remain in him. He's truth, and he wants to teach his disciples the truth, to be able to see clearly. In one of the Gospels, one man that the Lord prays with, who's blind, he, at first, when the Lord lays hands on him and prays with him, he only sees a little bit like tr- men, like trees walking. And then he lays his hand on him and he's completely healed of his blindness. Well, that's like us. As we progress in union with God, in relationship with the Lord, we see more and more clearly. He wants us to be able to see the truth, and that comes from being with the Lord Jesus. So stay close to him. He says... If you continue in my word, Jesus says, if you will continue in my teaching, you are truly my disciples. A disciple remains, abides in his teaching, in Jesus' teaching. Then he says, you will truly be my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So staying in that relationship, learning from scripture and from the teaching of the church 
is the way to, to just bring transformation to us. Um, a primary place of attack is identity. Okay? Um, God's identity and your identity. It's a constant place of primary attack by the devil. If you think back uh, to Genesis 3, where we see the original sin, the fall of humanity. By the way, I heard one kid say uh, that first book is called the Book of Guinness. And Adam and Eve were, were born on an apple tree. Uh, but in that uh, ch- chapter 3 in the fall, the devil tempts Eve and asks her a set of questions that end up with where Eve says, we can eat of any of the trees, we just can't eat of the tree of life in the center of the garden. And he directly contradicts what the Lord has told him. He says, you will not die. And he says, you will be like God's. So what is he doing? He's, he's attacking the truthfulness, the trustworthiness of God. And one of the places that attack comes to us is in trusting God, that he's holy, that he's truthful, that he's faithful, that he really is for you and me. You've got a Father in heaven who is greater than any being. He is God above all creatures, and he's for you. So along with attempting us to doubt God's identity and his goodness, he, he goes after ours. Think of Jesus after his baptism in the Jordan. He's led out into the wilderness. And the primary temptation is if you are the Son of God. And he'll do the same thing with us who are baptized, who are in Christ Jesus. He'll try to get us to doubt our place, our position, that we really are children of God. So be aware of that is some of the ways he works. He goes after our identity. He attacks directly at our identity. Now, the chief place where the battle takes place is in our minds. It's in our thinking. Paul tells us, For the weapons of our warfare are not worldly, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every proud obstacle to the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. So the mind is a a primary battleground where evil spirits can speak to us. I remember one time uh, my wife Ellie and I were with our Christ Life team somewhere uh, doing a a Christ Life training conference for uh, an archdiocese and she was off with some of the ladies on our team, and I was in the hotel room alone, and I started having these bizarre sexual thoughts. And um, they were so alien to me that it was clear that I was being fed stuff, but it was one of those things of identifying, recognizing this is certainly not of God, and this is not something I want to entertain in my flesh. So there's ways that that kind of thing happens, and especially in areas where it's ongoing kind of strongholds in our thinking. And what we want to do is take uh, the words of Paul in Romans 12, where he says, don't be conformed to the world, or don't be pressed into the worldview of this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may know what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So we, we should know by now, no matter how far we've gone with our walk with the Lord, that there's more that needs to change in the way I think. And Paul's encouraging us, don't, don't allow yourself to be conformed to the worldview of this age. Don't be subject to to the enemy's way of thinking about things, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that renewal happens in the Holy Spirit, who's been given to you to sanctify you, to change the way you think about things. So you can really think about things the way God thinks about them, and you as his child think about them. So keep that in mind um, in terms of these different things that may be going on as strongholds in our thinking. The devil condemns the Holy Spirit convicts or convinces. This is really important in terms of thinking stuff. The devil condemns. 
he, he just, as soon as you do something wrong, you sin, you think something wrong, he's going to condemn you. The Holy Spirit, when we're doing things that aren't right, will convict you in order to lead you to repent and to turn from the way you're going. That's, that's a really critical kind of thing. So you're watching TV and you just get this sense, I should really turn this off. It could be because of the content. It could be because you realize at the end of the night, I'm going to feel like, why did I waste the whole night watching that? Ever feel like that? I know I'm probably the only one who feels like that. But, but you, you'll get promptings of the loving God who's saying, Dave, turn it off. And all you know is you just have a sense of, I should turn it off. So, you know, when you get that, respond to the Lord. There's different times throughout our days where you'll get an inclination that's the Holy Spirit convicting us, not condemning us, but trying to help us to be renewed in our thinking and in our lifestyle. Okay. Um, some areas of common attack. Areas where it's worth us closing the door on unwelcome guests. A personal habitual sin. If we know there's something that's going on all the time and you start to feel like, I'm not even going to confession. Why go to confession every week, every month? I'm you know, confessing the same thing. There may be these kind of things that have been access points into our lives that have the influence uh, of the enemy, of the evil spirit. Um, woundedness from family of origin. It could be abandonment. Many of us have uh, issues that have occurred from family about abandonment. could be abuse from our family of origin, insecurities and anxiousness. Um, you know, I, I've, I've met people who say, you know, I have morning depression, but my mom had it and my grandmother had it. It's just, it's just who I am. Well, maybe not. It could be physiological based, you know, but it may be the influence of evil spirits that where the Lord wants to break the power of some kind of depression that's happening there that really isn't what God intends for you. Even if it's physiological and you need medication, it's not God's intention for you. Um, changes in life, uh, trauma that happens to us personally, the death of a loved one, Divorce, you know, I went through a divorce. It was ter terrible. It was tragic. It was extremely painful, not only for me, but for my entire family. And after it, I just felt so condemned. How can you go on calling yourself a Catholic Christian? How can you think about, you know, helping anybody else to follow, follow the Lord? You know, all that kind of stuff. Why don't you sit down, shut up? I mean, real attack. So there can be things like that that happen where the enemy wants to capitalize on them um, and bring about bad fruit rather than redemption where we come closer to the Lord as we turn to him and ask for his help and we, we have some brothers and sisters that we can, we can share with, we can, we can walk with through those kind of things. So cling to the Lord in those kind of things. Persevere with him. A um, couple other things. Thoughts that accuse or condemn are often inspired by the father of lies. Thoughts that accuse or condemn. L listen to this. I just I thought this would be useful. De the devil says, he's whispering in your ear, you are stupid. You don't have anything to offer. You respond, I'm stupid. I don't have anything to give. Devil, nobody loves you. You are a loser. Nobody loves me. I'm a loser. You might as well do yourself in. Why go on living? And then all of a sudden the light dawns, wait a minute, that's a little far-fetched, you know? In the name of Jesus, I renounce that condemnation, that accusation. Get away. Get away. So there's accusations. In one study, scientific study, showed that 80% of most people's thoughts are negative. Think of that. So monitor your thoughts during the day. You want them on the Lord. You want them on his joy, his goodness, his mercy. So, um, irrational impulses. You're driving along, behaving yourself, and all of a sudden you get this thought, drive into the telephone pole. You know, just wacky, you know. Uh, you're at work and the boss is giving you a hard time and you go through this incredible fantasy. You're trying to get on the highway and the guy next to you won't, 
you know, yield to you. you and nobody has had that happen, I know, except for me. <laughs> in fact, on the way over here, and I'm, I'm imagining, you know, if I could put air torpedoes, in, in, you know, you know. <laughs> I have to say, God have mercy. <laughs> Turn to you. So the, those kind of things. Um, attempts, just a few other things. Attempts to block the work of the Lord in our lives and in his church. So here's a couple examples. You're riding to Mass in the morning as a family, and the fight breaks out. Almost, you can almost guarantee it. Well, do we ever think that it might be, there might be some help, some support to get into the fight every Sunday before Mass because we're going for the Lord's Day to celebrate with our brothers and sisters and to have the Eucharist? So stop and think about that. Then you get out to the car after you receive communion and you're pulling out and this guy cuts you off and you want to say, hello. (laughs) (laughs) Things that divide us uh, in terms of our life in the Lord. Another area, disunity in the church. And I mean not only in your parish, but in the Catholic church universally, internationally, but also our brothers and sisters in other Christian traditions. Now, I want to urge you to bless our brothers and sisters in other traditions. This is really critical. In John 17, Jesus prayed that we would be one so that the world would know that the Father sent him. Pope John Paul the Great said that it's a scandal that we're in disunity because we're not in unity with the Savior's prayer. So I want to encourage you. That's another area that's important because the devil comes to divide his people. He can conquer when he divides us. Contact with the occult. If you've been involved with any occult practices, tarot, card reading, Ouija Ouija boards, fortune tellers, contacting the dead, witchcraft, occult books or charms, you need to renounce those and destroy them. It's just, a, it, it, this is an area where you can just count on. This is the way the Lord looks at it. Get rid of it. Renounce it. And get prayer uh, because of it. And we're not talking about possession in any of these things with influence of evil spirits. Possession is a full-on kind of work of the devil where he's taken over the will of a person. They can, prayer is not helping them get forward. Personal prayer Um, We're we're talking about influence of evil spirits holding areas in our life. It's a whole different thing than possession or the need for exorcism. Uh, That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about lies and areas where there's a hook from the evil spirits. In Acts 19, there's this great story. A number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted the value and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. This was a fortune. But they repented of the way they were going and turned to the Lord Jesus. And they realized these occult practices were the work of the devil. They got rid of them. They renounced them. So um, let me give you five keys uh, to freedom. These keys are in the Christ Life series in different places. I borrow here from a dear friend of mine, Neil Lozano, who has a great book that I'd encourage you uh, to, to read sometime called Unbound. The first is Repentance and Faith. And in Discovering Christ, you know that we call people to realize Jesus is Lord and to make a decision of the will to surrender to Jesus' lordship and to being Savior and asking to be filled, to be renewed in the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's a repentance. It's turning from going my way to turning to, to the Lord. And that's not something that just happens once. It's a continual work of conversion. So where we realize he's bringing to our attention, convicting us of certain areas where we're not in sync with the Lord, then we can repent and have faith to turn to him for him to change this particular area. So repentance and faith is the first key. Forgiveness. We've had the forgiving one another session, which is so critical for us to maintain forgiving hearts, to have a lifestyle of forgiving one another because it's crucial for freedom from the influence of evil spirits. Third, renunciation. 
Uh, at the Vigil Mass and Easter Masses, we, we pray this Easter renewal of our baptism where we renounce Satan and all of his works and his empty promises. Well, renunciation is basically doing that. It's renouncing areas where we see, I renounce the work of lust in my life. I don't want any more to do with it in Jesus' name. So it's a declaration that I'm no longer part of the kingdom of darkness. I don't want to fellowship with this stuff. I am now in the kingdom of Christ. He's my Lord, and I want to walk with him. I renounce this stuff in his name. So renunciation is really a key thing. It's also a key just in I mean, ongoing life situations where we think things and we realize we can renounce it. Fourth one is authority. Jesus gives us authority over evil spirits. So we can actually name these things that we realize are a problem for us and command them to go away, to leave us in the name of Jesus. Um, I want to mention also about authority, one, th- one other uh, thing, and not only in terms of influence of thinking and stuff. Some of you may have had nightmares or night terrors where you wake up and you feel the presence of fear. We now in Christ can say, in the name of Jesus, I renounce the spirit of fear and I command you to leave. He's actually given you that authority and it's awesome. Okay? So if you have something that you feel like is attacking you, attacking you in the day or night, you can say, I renounce you, you spirit of, in Jesus' name, leave. <laughs> He's so good to us. He doesn't leave us orphans. He empowers us and equips us as children of God. So the fifth key is the Father's blessing. And uh, we had the time where we, uh, during the Spirit-empowered session, where we prayed for one another, for God the Father to bless one another. And that's an important part of the five keys, is to know the Father loves us and to be able to pray for one another to know that. So I want to close now by just saying God is so good. Uh, He loves you guys. I know he loves me. One time in prayer, I had this extraordinary experience. I was in Mexico, as a matter of fact, and I was in a very busy situation. And during my prayer time, even though it was busy, I had my prayer time, and I felt like the Lord said, do you know and understand who I have made you to be? My son, my servant, my friend. And that is a truth for every one of you. And he's got your back. He's done everything that's necessary for you to live as a disciple of Jesus, to live as a son or daughter of God. So now we're going to take time and uh, have a a prayer ministry time. You can uh, have your leader there lead you in this prayer. And for us here, we're going to actually take some time for that, okay? Thank you.